Welcome to the Global Missions Podcast, a show for Christ followers who want to participate more effectively in God's work, both at home and to the ends of the earth. Visit us at globalmissionspodcast.com to find show notes, resources, and previous episodes. And now, here's your host, Rob Magwood, better known to many friends as Mags. Hi, everyone. We are getting close to the end of this fifth season of the Global Missions Podcast, and soon our team will take a short break from production over the summer. It has now become our regular practice, however, to conduct an annual listener survey, and we want to hear from you. Would you take just five minutes and help us understand what's working, what's not working, and what you'd love to hear on this podcast in the next year? We'd be grateful for your help as our main goal is to make this program beneficial to you, our listeners. You can find the survey on our website at globalmissionspodcast.com slash survey or find the link from our Facebook page. On today's episode of the Global Missions Podcast, we'll be discussing the subject of people with disabilities or impairments serving in missions. We'll be speaking with Dave Duell, who is an author and co-editor of an important book on this subject. Dave will help remind us how God accomplishes great things through people with disabilities. He'll also offer some advice to church leaders as we consider ways to help honor and equip and send people with disabilities to participate in missions. Dave Duell is joining us, and Dave serves as the catalyst for the Lausanne Disability Concerns Issue Network. He's also an academic dean or dean emeritus for the Master's Academy International, which is a fellowship of ministry training schools around the world. And he serves as the senior research fellow at Johnny and Friends, a ministry which facilitates ministry among the disabled globally. Dave, Dr. Dave Duell, welcome to the program. Thank you, Megs. I appreciate the opportunity to share my message. Yeah, I'm glad to have you today. I'm looking forward to learning with you. And Dave has given me permission just to call him Dave throughout this. Just a vast experience has been entrusted to Dave over the years and really qualified to help us explore this question of how do we wrestle with disability and missions? Dave, let's start with just a foundational question to help us set the stage. What do we mean today when we use this term disability? This is a great question. It's not an easy question to answer, but it's worth discussing. I think it helps to understand the term disability by introducing a second term, and that's impairment. Mm. A fairly common description says that impairment is part of living. It's, it's very natural. People have ranges of challenges, physical and otherwise. So impairment is just part of who we are and the way that we live our lives. So a disability, on the other hand, is a social construct, meaning it's a word that we've come up with to describe our understanding of the way that impairment fits into the world around us in our social interactions. So by social construct, they mean that the term disability has a tendency to segregate people with impairments, even if not intentionally. This tends to make the person with a disability an object of pity to be cared for and has not helped people with disabilities to fit into churches and live regular lives. Many people with a disability will tell you that compared to the isolating effect of the term and the mindset, more importantly, of disability, their impairment is is considerably less damaging. In other words, whatever impairment they face, physical or otherwise, is not as problematic or not as big a problem as the actual social interpretation of that by the people around them. That's correct. Hmm. Wow. Boy, that is in itself a great lesson for us to be reminded of. I wonder, when you speak of impairments and challenges, what what are some of the things that you help with, help us understand these impairments and challenges that these people experience? It helps to think about impairments from the perspective of functionality. Impairments are challenges people experience in seeing, hearing, speaking, thinking, or mobility ambulating. Rather than talk about the deaf or people who are deaf, a much softer and and more acceptable way 
of addressing this group is hearing impaired. And you're going to hear that more. If you haven't heard it already, I think you'll hear it in the future quite a bit. It may replace the the term deaf, which for people who are hearing impaired is a pejorative term. It's a little hard for us to understand. They may refer to themselves as the deaf, but we have to understand that that's a term that they've come to grudgingly accept because that's the way that they're referred to. They would much rather be referred to and understood as hearing impaired. Well, this is really helpful for us. And even before we come to the topic of missions and intersecting with this, just as we want to honor those who are impaired, to say hearing impaired, I have heard some of this emerging, and hopefully we can help cultivate some of that. It just sounds like it is more honoring, it's respectful, it's acknowledging an impairment, but not a, not necessarily negative or not as negative somehow. That's what I hear you saying. That's correct. And language has a tendency to become pejorative over time. So some of these words were perfectly acceptable when they were coined, and they developed a history. And as time went on, the social implications of the terms became quite negative and, as you said, hurtful to the people who have the impairments. We'll talk about disability during this conversation today. Just know that we're in a phase where the term disability is passing off, passing away, and being replaced with with other terminology that is softer and more encouraging to people with disabilities. Okay. Well, I appreciate you helping sensitize us to that. I'm glad it'll come up again here. Tell us just a little bit about your journey. What has led you to be passionate about this topic of assisting or being alongside those who face impairments in missions? God has blessed me with a wonderful upbringing. My mother was very conscious of helping people with disabilities. So when she needed to go to work one day, she selected a babysitter who had a child with an impairment. So when I outgrew that babysitter, and I did so reluctantly, just love those people, and the young woman is a friend today, the young woman with a disability. We maintain our friendship. But I started at that point hanging around the neighborhood kids like everyone else who were my own age. One boy was very quiet and sometimes struggled to control his emotions. I told my mother about him, and she said, do you recall going to the babysitter? who had a child with a disability your age who had difficulty walking. She was focusing on functionality functionality as she taught me. She said, well, this boy has difficulty thinking sometimes. You have to watch out for him. And if any of your other friends decide to pick on him, you need to defend him. So when I got married, I acquired a beloved sister-in-law with an intellectual disability. You see, my wife's family served as missionaries to Nigeria. And all three children caught malaria, which is quite common. But my sister-in-law ran a dangerously high fever, sometimes called cerebral malaria, which left her intellectually impaired. My wife's family came home from Nigeria on the first furlough and never went back to Nigeria, although they longed to return. In fact, they tried to raise support to go back, but were unable. My in-laws would never talk about it, but were, were very sad about this. This is a tough topic because they love Nigeria. Both of them, and they, they're with the Lord now, were fluent in Hausa, the language of the region they were in in Nigeria, and they absolutely loved Nigeria. In fact, for years after, my in-laws spoke Hausa at home. Well, then, when my second daughter was born with Down syndrome, I immediately got involved with Johnny and Friends in international outreach, and we made many trips primarily to Eastern Europe, which had opened up from communism. But our original plan as a family, was to go to China. We had considered going to China, where I would teach in a seminary, which is what I ended up doing anyhow. When my second daughter was born, the leaders of our church and some others, and the doctors also, told us that it would not be a good idea to take her to China because China's healthcare system was emerging at that point. And it's actually very good today. So to the point of your question, all of my background that's made me passionate about disability came through my personal experience in my family. Mm. Thank you for sharing some of that. This led you in time to actually create a book. Uh, Dave is an author. The title is Disability and Missions. Why a book on this, Dave? 
My co-editor and another author in the book is an Australian physician who also is a parent of a child with a disability. He actually does medical missions work specifically for people with disabilities. I can't mention where it is in India, but it's in the, the country. A common friend introduced the two of us on a phone call. Within 30 minutes, we were discussing the need for such a book, as well as how we might structure the book's argument. He also is a career academic and a researcher by trade, like me. And so we hit it off and immediately started working on the book. It happened instantly. Uh, We're good friends today and are working on other publications together related to the topic. One is a blog on disability admission that Johnny and friends will start posting in the fall. And the other is an article on how people with disability are created in the image of God, just like everyone else, and what the implications of that are. Well, we can hear very clearly how the Lord has prepared your way, both in personal experience and in academics for this. Dave, many of our listeners are part of missions committees at their local church. In your experience, what are some of the reasons that missions committees or churches may be concerned or reluctant about including or sending a person with impairments to a mission field? Yes, thank you. Excellent question. In some ways, this is probably the more critical, if not the most critical question that we'll try to answer. First of all, know that I sympathize because I've served on the missions committees of the churches I've been a part of and still do to this day. First of all, may I say that Our book is a friendly appeal to our brothers and sisters in missions leadership. As I said, my co-author is a medical missionary, and I train missionaries and start national mission schools in other countries. For this reason, the book is intended to stir up a conversation with missions leaders whom we love and admire. In no sense is it a scolding or any kind of a rebuke. It's just not that. So these things said, I think there are two primary reasons that any of us might question the decision to send people with disabilities and their families to the mission field with a number of variations for each of the two. So first, there's a question of safety. Is it reckless endangerment to send a person with a disability and their family to the mission? It's well-intentioned. It's extremely well-intentioned. And uh, going back to my family's history, I think if I served on a mission board or if I served on a missions committee, Back in the early 1950s, I would have discouraged my in-laws from going back to the field. hope that's clear. It's a new day, and that's going to be a part of my argument, is what has happened since and what we've learned and the benefits that we have. But this is a significant issue. And again, recall my in-laws not being uh, recommissioned to Nigeria. Again, recall in our own lives, it was our pastor. And our physician has said, it's not a good idea to take your daughter to China. So we didn't go. We listened. I think even 30 years ago, my daughter's 32 now, it would have been a bad decision to go. It would have been reckless endangerment. So with all that in mind, the concern for health is a legitimate one. And the concern for safety is a legitimate one. And I don't want to create an argument that sounds like reckless abandon and endangerment. It's not that. My standard and general response to this concern is that called and gifted people with disabilities who want to go to the mission field and have demonstrated time and again that they can be resilient in health today may well be considered. Each case should be determined individually, of course, but I think that some things have changed. People can, with disabilities, can find safety and good health support on the mission field. And we're going to talk about member care in just a moment and the critical role that member cares plays today. Because member care wasn't so, I guess, vibrant, maybe, is the term 30 and 50 years ago. So the first concern that you've mentioned in particular is safety of a family or of an individual in the family as they consider going to the mission field. And that just needs to be considered on a case-by-case basis in our new day and with the new potential that we have, the new possibilities that we have. That's correct. And the second the second point is really I can cast it as a question. Can they successfully, they, people with impairments, successfully do the work of missions? It's a competence question as opposed to an endangerment question. So the second concern is that we are setting up 
called and gifted people for failure on the mission field, and that they will come home quickly hurt and feeling like failures. But the constantly improving role of member care in missions has provided a personalized program for a person with a disability to live a healthy and effective life as a missionary. It's part of member care to assess whether or not a person should indeed go to the field and ask the question, are they too fragile? Would it be? Would it be a reckless endangerment of that person? So I think, Dave, that you're really encouraging us to ask some of the same questions that we would ask of any applicant who's considering missions. We would ask, is it is it going to be reasonably safe? And different organizations will have different risk tolerance. We understand that. But, but is it going to be safe for that family or that individual to go? And do they have the competence to accomplish what the call includes? Your case would be in our new day, in part due to member care, for example, as well as other possibilities and maybe a broader understanding, that maybe we could open those doors a little wider with grace for those people that have various impairments. Yes. And that's well said. We're not talking about throwing the door open and saying every person with a disability should go to the mission field. We're talking about extending our policies to include people who now, in this day and age, can have a fruitful ministry of missions on the mission field and not be unduly endangered. There's always danger wherever you go, but it's a question of are we risking unnecessarily? We made the final chapter of our book a chapter written by a member care person who is doing an extraordinary job maintaining the health and the well-being of people with disabilities on the field for her mission. And so uh, you can read that chapter in the book if you feel so inclined. Wonderful. We're going to come back to Dave's book. I was just going to relate, you know, in our missions experience, we have had limited participation by folks with various impairments. And yet we're growing, especially with the hearing impaired. I'll say it this way. We have identified different groups of unreached peoples around the world who are hearing impaired. And that has led us to ask new questions about the hearing impaired who are in our sending churches. And I've now had conversation with several churches that have a ministry for the hearing impaired. And sometimes there will be an interpreter who sits at the front of the auditorium off to one side sometimes, and they're signing for the message. And as I've engaged with those churches, the pastors and the missions committees have said, you know, we have very mature disciples of Christ in our church they are not hearing, or they are hearing impaired, if I use the language you're encouraging, and we have not thought of them particularly as goers. They're part of our church here, and we're starting to explore the very real possibilities that these folks could make a wonderful contribution and be highly relatable to a community of hearing impaired people on a mission field. We just need to think through that new laneway and figure out, yeah, there's some things that we need to consider. But once we've considered those, that could be an open laneway. Is that what you're speaking to, Dave? Yes, it is. In fact, it's a great example because one of the challenge of missions in general is to understand the culture and the language of the individuals to whom you're going. And people who are deaf understand the deaf community well. Culture, they will tell you themselves, deaf culture is different highly sensitive culture, and they know the language as well. They've used it most of their lives, many of them, and so they're equipped culturally and linguistically to be more effective than someone who decides that they want to minister in a deaf culture somewhere and has no experience. Well, this is really good. In just a moment, I'm going to ask Dave to share some practical suggestions for us in churches, for missions committees, and even agencies as we consider sending people with impairments to the mission field or helping them engage in global missions. Just before we get to that part of the conversation, we'd like to share with you a missions resource that we hope will be helpful to you and your church. Do you have your 15 Days of Prayer for the Buddhist World booklet? This new informative prayer guide can help you learn about and pray for Buddhists around the world. To learn more and to order your copy, visit 15daysprayer.com. And now, back to today's conversation. We are back with Dr. David Duell of Johnny and Friends and the author and editor, contributing editor of a book entitled 
Disability in Mission. And Dave, I haven't mentioned the subtitle. I'm going to here. The subtitle is a very potential one. The Church's Hidden Treasure. Folks that have disabilities or impairments are a hidden treasure in our church. Dave, it's a beautiful subtitle. I love that. Would you share with us some examples where people with impairments have thrived in mission? Yes. In fact, uh, one I think is unusually beautiful. I'm going to take a biblical example first, and that's Moses. We all know about the life of Moses. And we've, we've heard Moses struggles when God wants to send him. Moses gives us one of the clearest windows on weakness. Weakness plays a critical role here in this argument. Unlike many leaders who might see themselves as strong, Moses knows that he's weak. In fact, he believes that he is so weak that God cannot use him to speak to Israel due to some disability or perceived deficiency. And it does appear to be a disability. Well, the most magnificent outcome in the story of Moses is that he ends up writing and singing two masterpiece songs to lead Israel in praising God. So, yes, the man who had the most intimate conversations with God could not bring himself to speak to people. But in the end, he leads them in praise to God. It's beautiful. The Moses story in the Old Testament is a story of recognized disability weakness where God gives the strength and enablement. So it's a beautiful story. The more modern one is an individual that you probably never heard of. Paul Kasanga was a Zambian leper whose body deteriorated to the point in which he could not walk or use what was left of his limbs. It's a very sad story in that way. I mean, he used what amounted to his knuckles for fingers to turn the pages of his Bible. But like the Apostle Paul that he was named after, God used Paul Kasanga's weakness to empower him for ministry. An extraordinary missionary woman named Olive Doka enabled Paul to preach, teach, and counsel married couples, even though neither one of them ever married. In hindsight, God used them to light the fires of evangelical revival in Zambia that resulted in around 80% of the entire population coming to Christ. It's incredible. And I read some of the firsthand accounts of people who were there at the time when it was happening. They, they attribute all of this mission success to God's use of a leper who had no hands, no feet, and someone had to help him get to where he would preach and teach and help him sit up in the doorway of his house to counsel couples in their marriages. It's a beautiful story of weakness enabled by God. It is beautiful. A uh, reminder both from Scripture and from our modern day. Dave, if this is stirring our hearts in our churches, we are going to need to get some traction on this. And so I want to move to practical advice that you would share with missions committees, mission agencies, as we consider helping send people with disabilities, with impairments to a field or into ministry. What are some of the things we need to consider? I think in terms of what really counts the most, and it's, it's good to keep our eyes on this, it's an individual's giftedness and calling. Weakness, as the Apostle Paul describes it, is predicated on calling that is expressed in giftedness. Weakness begs for enablement. And as Paul says, my strength is made perfect in weakness. Well, who does the perfecting? The unspoken agent is God. It's called the divine passive in Scripture, and God brings Paul's weakness to perfection and its completion. Weakness is God's theater of the unlikely and the unexpected. God loves to baffle us in our independence and self-promotion. Identify giftedness and calling, and the weakness is the theater where God does some of his most beautiful work. It's so true. So if we can identify giftedness and calling, help us think about training and preparation. Yes. All training for everyone begins in the local church when it comes to missions. It's kind of an accepted 
principle, churches are powerhouses of training for missionaries. For 30 years before I I came on full-time at Johnny and Friends, I trained pastors and teachers who started training ministry training schools in other countries. One of these graduated 14 hearing-impaired pastors a few years back. It's that mindset that I'm advocating most strongly, and that is that the local church sees it as its opportunity, its blessing, to be the starting point for people with disabilities as they start training and preparing for whatever God would have them to do. Maybe for some of them it's missions, others it's Sunday school teaching, serving in some other way in the church. Some are called to be pastors. I've actually been blessed to train a number of pastors through my seminary experience over the years, pastors who had disabilities, some of them very severe. And it's amazing to see the Lord use them. But training begins in the local church, and it continues on from there. It will have to be custom-tailored for the person with a disability, although it's great news today that many seminaries are offering special scholarships for persons with disabilities. And if someone is looking for information on that, I'd be happy to help them find the schools that are, are doing that right now. Well, I'm pleased to hear that there's a a realization of the potential, maybe substantial, untapped potential of people who have impairments. If we have been reticent for whatever reason, that there are opportunities there. Yes. If one in, and this is what the World Health Organization tells us, one in seven people in the world have disabilities. Our people with disabilities are underrepresented as leaders in churches and missions in in every aspect. So we have the privilege in this day and age of encourage them, encouraging them much better than we've been able to before. Mm-hmm. That's really good. You've mentioned member care especially. I wonder if you'd comment on what we should anticipate, what we should plan and prepare for with regard to member care. Um, I think in, in terms of the process of training and sending, let's say a hearing impaired person is called to missions and shows evidence of giftedness. Connecting them with member care as soon as possible would be ideal because member care is much broader than just caring for the person on the field. It actually reaches out to them while they're in preparation to go to the field. And so member care is, I don't want to present it as the panacea for every problem, but the member care people have done us a great service by offering their help in getting people with disabilities to the mission field and caring for them while they're there. I wonder whether you have any recommendations to the agency who might be receiving and integrating someone with an impairment into their team. Is there anything particular? Obviously, there are going to be specifics. That's true of any any family. But is there any advice that you would offer to the agency who's receiving these folks? I would start by saying keep up the good work because our mission agencies are doing wonderful work. I think in terms of integrating people with disabilities into different roles in mission agencies, it would be a good thing to have several people who have a disability perspective. I don't want to say select a person with this or that particular disability, but someone who maybe through family experience or through their own experience has strong familiarity with the issues of disabilities. It would be good to have that voice somewhere in the agency's structure, perhaps as a board member, perhaps as an employee, certainly as people that we send to the field. But I've discovered that the more people with disabilities involved in what's going on, the the stronger the perspective will be and the more wholesome will be the atmosphere for understanding disability on the whole. Uh, Again, no one is opposed to to people with disabilities, no one is opposed to disability. It's a question of how. How do we do this? And uh, getting more people with disabilities involved is the key to that. You know, we tend to have a value, Dave, in the West, and I'm speaking in generalities, of course, but we value efficiency and effectiveness. I wonder how you would reply to someone that would detract a little and say, well, this just wouldn't be as efficient it wouldn't be as effective. It just doesn't get it done as fast, maybe. We need to move more quickly, or we need to work with greater efficiency. How would you reply to that concern? That's a great question, because this is typically a concern 
with people with disabilities who are in wheelchairs and so forth, I would say look at the outcome and look at the end. And you won't know it until we're there. But you'll realize, we'll realize, all of us, very quickly that people with disabilities have a different way because they've learned to do things that way. They've learned to be effective and efficient in the ways that they do things. And it may look slow to us, but they're very calculated in their ability to assess the danger of a situation, assess the work, the difficulty of a situation. And so I think it will be good if uh, we have them and their voice again in the conversation that it will be so important. And there will be many of these conversations. It will be critical. Well, you have stirred our hearts with this, and we acknowledge that we're just touching, just introducing the topic. Dave, I'd like to ask you about resources that you would recommend to our listeners. What are some of the resources you would recommend? And we will include these in the show notes, by the way. Regular listeners will know we keep show notes, but anything that Dave mentions, we will gladly make available on the website. Dave? Yes. Well, it's it's always awkward to recommend your own writings. Go ahead. It's okay. <laughs> Thank you, Max. But there are two writings that have been intentionally written to address this topic. The book, Disability in Mission, was written specifically for this purpose as a, a friendly invitation to consider another way when it comes to disability and missions as a process. And so the, the stories in there will speak for themselves. They need no other argument. The people's lives and their work for the Lord their stories are compelling, so I, I urge you to read the book. There is an article that was a precursor to the book. It's called Developing Young Leaders with Disabilities, A Ministry Beyond Our Wildest Dreams. It's in a uh, publication called the Lausanne Global Analysis. If you like, you can send me an email, and I can just send you a PDF of it. Or you can go to the Lausanne website and go to the Lausanne Global Analysis, and uh, 2015, you'll find that article. Okay. We'll also include a link to that as well. Are there any other links or organizations that you'd mentioned, Dave? I would keep your eye on the work of Ben Connor at uh, Northwestern Seminary. He's doing research on this now, uh, this very topic. Johnny and Friends, if you go to their website, they have a lot of resources that address these topics. And so I would encourage you to go to johnnyandfriends.org and just go to their resources section, ministry resources. Super. You've alluded to this already, Dave. If any of our listeners would like to reach out to you or follow up with you, ask more questions, how might they do that? Best way is to contact me through email, and that's D D E U E L at johnnyandfriends.org. Well, Dave, this has been a very rich uh, time. Thank you for this time spent together. Dr. Dave Duell, and author and editor of a 2019 book, Disability in Mission. Listen to this, The Church's Hidden Treasure. Dave, thanks so much for taking this time with us today. Thank you for having me, Max. Well, I was really moved by our discussion today and was reminded again of how God accomplishes beautiful things through those who are humble those who may have various impairments, and yet who need to fully rely on Him. We often strive to build and maximize capacity, and I think that's a good thing. But this was just a helpful reminder again that our Lord simply sometimes has other ways to accomplish His purposes. Thanks for listening today. Please don't forget to check out the 2020 Listener Survey. It's now open at globalmissionspodcast.com slash survey. We are looking forward to hearing from you. This episode is brought to you by the Global Missions Toolbox and produced by Send International in collaboration with other like-minded agencies. On behalf of our team, thanks for listening. Join us again in two weeks for the final episode of this fifth season when we'll continue to explore this grand adventure of being Christ's witnesses to the ends of the earth.